The problem of evil has plagued people's confidence in the existence of God for thousands of years. Why? People wonder, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, why doesn't he stop all the evil and suffering in the world from occurring? Why do we have so many starving children in the world? Why do people suffer from chronic pain? Why is there death and destruction? This is perhaps the number one argument for atheism's truth claim that there is no God. There are a couple of different versions of this argument that atheists defend. They are, one, the logical version, and two, the evidential version. I've already addressed the logical version in my previous video. In this video, I will address the evidential version of the problem of evil, which is the version most contemporary atheist philosophers defend. Unlike the logical version, which puts an impossibly heavy burden of proof on the atheist, because the logical version requires that the atheist prove that God cannot possibly have any good reasons for allowing suffering at all, the evidential version is more modest and requires that the atheist prove less. In this version of the argument, the atheist argues that in light of the evil and suffering in the world, God's existence is rendered unlikely. The evidential advocate can concede that God and suffering are logically compatible, but they make the more modest claim that suffering renders the existence of God less probable than if there were no suffering. Before I get into why I think the evidential version of the problem of evil fails, allow me to take a moment to steel man the argument. While God may have justifiable reasons for allowing some suffering, surely every single instance of suffering that has occurred over the past 100,000 years of human history in the lives of millions of individuals cannot have any good reasons, right? Surely, out of all the evil and suffering in the world, at least some must be gratuitous, and ergo a good God would have reason to intervene and stop them. Surely, every single one of my chronic headaches cannot serve any good purpose. Some of them must be gratuitous, and if they're gratuitous, a good God, a loving God, a God who loves me, would heal me and stop me from my suffering. Since the likelihood of there being purposeless suffering is high, then God, being all-powerful and all-loving, would both want to and have the power to stop them. Since they are not stopped, God must not be all-powerful, all-loving, or both. Now, is it possible that God could have reasons for allowing every instance of suffering that occurs? Sure. This is not the logical version of the problem of evil. But is it likely that God has a good reason for allowing every single one of these instances of suffering? The atheist, the evidential problem of evil advocate, would say, no, it is unlikely that every single one has a good reason. I have a three-pronged response to this argument. Response 1. Our cognitive limitations render such probability judgments impossible. I don't think we're in a position to judge one way or another whether it's probable that God has good reasons for permitting suffering. We're just not in a position to make such probability judgments given that we humans are limited in time and space and are of finite knowledge. God, on the other hand, is omniscient. He sees the end of history from its beginning, Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10, and he knows what would occur in any given circumstance. The only one who would be in a position to make such probability judgments would be God himself. In chapter 7 of his book, On Guard, Defending Your Faith with Reason and Precision, Dr. William Lane Craig offers two illustrations to flush out this point, one from contemporary science and the other from pop culture. The first illustration that Dr. Craig uses draws on the concept of chaos theory. Chaos theory asserts that tiny disturbances in a system can set off a chain reaction that leads to catastrophic consequences. Craig refers to a butterfly fluttering its little wings on a tree branch. People looking just think, aw, what a pretty butterfly. 
But little do they know that the fluttering of this butterfly's wings has set in motion a chain of events which eventually result in a massive hurricane over the Pacific Ocean. No one looking at that butterfly could possibly know that a hurricane would be the outcome of what they're observing. The second illustration Dr. Craig uses draws from the movie Sliding Doors, which features a woman named Helen, portrayed by actress Gwyneth Paltrow. The movie opens with Helen hurrying downstairs to catch a train, but as she nears the train, her life splits into two totally different timelines, two totally different lives Helen could live. In one life, she is enormously successful, prosperous, and happy. In the other life, she encounters failure, misery, and unhappiness. Whichever life she lives through will all depend on a split-second difference. A split-second difference of whether or not she is able or not able to pass through the subway doors. Dr. William Lane Craig then points out that that difference, whether or not she makes it through the subway doors, is due to whether a little girl playing with her dolly is either A, snatched away by her father, or B, momentarily blocks Helen's path. Craig says that we have to wonder about the events that led up to that event. Craig says that perhaps whether A or B occurs is due to whether the girl and her father were delayed leaving the house that morning because his daughter refused to eat her cereal, or whether the man just wasn't paying attention to what his daughter was doing because she was, he was preoccupied with reading the newspaper. And what led up to that event? We don't have a clue. The movie has a twist at the end. Spoiler alert. In the happy and successful life, Helen is killed. In the life that brought her so much misery, it turns around and she finds true love. Dr. William Lane Craig's point is that given our cognitive limitations, we are in no position to judge whether or not God can have a morally sufficient reason for permitting any given event. Given the dizzying complexity of life and the incomprehensible way in which events are intertwined with one another, it is beyond the mental capacity of mere man to say with any confidence whatsoever that when some incident of suffering occurs, God probably doesn't have a good reason for allowing it. From, her from Helen's perspective, whether or not she got through the sliding doors didn't seem like such a life-changing event to her. But obviously, to those who watched the movies, we know how much of a difference it really made. And if you're an omniscient being like God, you know whether a certain event happens or not, will, what radical effects on the future that that will have. If you want a certain event in the future to occur, you'll have to allow a certain event in the present to occur. If A doesn't happen, then B won't happen. If B doesn't happen, then C won't happen. If C doesn't happen, then D won't happen. If D doesn't happen, then E won't happen. In order to get event E to happen, you'll have to allow events A through D to happen. Events A through D may be events that involve horrible suffering, but event E is a greater good which justifies the allowance of events A through D. God knew that if he didn't allow sufferings A through D, then greater good E would not occur. So if you ask me, why didn't God strike the 9-11 terrorists down before they could destroy the World Trade Center? I would answer, I don't know. But God knows. God knew the ripple effect that would emerge from that single event. We have no idea what those ripples were, but God does. Perhaps God had a plethora of morally sufficient reasons for permitting the World Trade Center to fall that will manifest themselves at a plethora of different points in time in a plethora of different people's lives for centuries to come. Maybe there's multiple events in different countries in America, India, Japan, China in the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th centuries that would not come about unless God allowed the towers 
to fall. Time travel enthusiasts know full well that changing even a single tiny event can send ripples through time. It can totally, drastically change the future. Every event brings about other events. So if one event doesn't occur, the events that that event prompts or causes won't occur. God, being omniscient, will know what will happen whether he allows or intervenes to stop X from occurring. If X would bring about a greater good, or if X would prevent a greater disaster, God might allow it. The Bible actually teaches that God does this. For example, in Romans 8.28 we read, quote, And we know that God works all things for the good of those who love him. End quote. The Bible also includes an intriguing example in which God permitted evil and suffering, but clearly brought about a greater good in the end. That example is the story of Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 to 50. Joseph was the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Joseph was one of Jacob's twelve sons. Joseph's brothers hated him because he was Jacob's favorite child, and this was obvious from the fact that Jacob constantly showered Joseph with far more affection than his other children. One day, Joseph's brothers finally had enough, and they sold him into slavery. As if being a slave weren't bad in and of itself, Joseph suffered in his slavery as well. Pontifar's wife falsely accused Joseph of trying to rape her. She did this out of spite because she came on to him and he refused to have sex with her. This resulted in Joseph being sent to prison. While Joseph was in prison, he was able to accurately interpret the dreams of two other prisoners who were there with him. One of those prisoners told the pharaoh about Joseph's amazing ability to accurately interpret dreams once they were released, and pharaoh was in need of having someone interpret his dreams. Pharaoh let Joseph out of prison, and Joseph told him his dreams. Joseph told the pharaoh that his two dreams meant that there would be seven years of abundant food, followed by seven years of horrible famine and that to prevent widespread starvation, he should store up food during the seven years of abundance so that they could compensate for the lack of food the next seven years. Pharaoh elected Joseph as governor and put him in charge of food storage. As bad as Joseph's ex experience was, God had a good reason for allowing it all to happen. If God hadn't let Joseph's brother sell him into slavery, Joseph would never have been able to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, and that would mean that Pharaoh would not have known to save up food during the seven years of abundance so that they would have food to eat during the seven years of famine, and that would mean that thousands of people would have died of starvation. As Joseph was being carried off to Egypt, he was probably wondering why God didn't intervene to stop his brothers from selling him into slavery. He might have been thinking, why didn't God stop my brothers from selling me into slavery? Now I'll never see my father and younger brother Benjamin again. If Joseph had reasoned like an atheist, he would have thought, I can't see any good reason for God not to have intervened to stop my brothers from selling me into slavery, so God must not have a good reason, and God must not exist. But Joseph later realized God's good purpose for allowing his suffering, and Jacob's suffering as well for that matter, since Jacob was mourning because he believed a wild animal had killed Joseph. Joseph himself said so when he saw his brothers again years later. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. God had a reason for not intervening when Joseph's brothers were sinning against him, but from Joseph's vantage point, it was impossible to discern that reason until much later. As William Lane Craig said, quote, when we contemplate God's providence over the whole of human history, directing a world of free creatures to his provisioned ends, then I think you can see that we are simply not in a position to say with any sort of confidence that God probably doesn't have a morally sufficient reason for allowing the suffering that we observe in the world." End quote. Rebuttal. We don't know the probability that God would allow any one event, but the improbability increases the more instances are taken into account.
One attempt to undermine the skeptical theistic response that I've heard comes from a fellow who frequents the Facebook page of Cerebral Faith. He wrote, quote, We don't know the odds that God would allow evil event X, so let's say that the odds are 50-50. This applies to each evil event, although I'm sure the actual odds get worse as the level of evil goes up. So when you multiply all of the trillions of evil events together, the odds are essentially zero, end quote. Is this a good response? No. Whether God has a reason for allowing one evil isn't probabilistically independent of whether he has a reason for allowing other evils. So just multiplying probabilities together isn't the right way to do the calculation. An analogy will suffice to show why this thinking is flawed. Let us suppose the chance that any given experience of God is veridical is only one in a million, but billions and billions of people claim to have experienced God. So it's virtually certain that at least one of those experiences was veridical. That's a bad argument, and for the same reason. My interlocutor responded, quote, I don't see the issue with the veridical experience of God argument. If that was the case, we would expect there to be at least one such experience. It's just doing the math, end quote. Well, actually, that is the case. Many people from around the world claim to experience either God's presence, an activity of God, or something of a supernatural type of thing. We can just take the number of near-death experiences alone. It doesn't take a whole lot of research to find them. The in even entire television programs have been dedicated to near-death experiences. So suppose the chance that any given near-death experience is veridical is only one in a million, but billions and billions of people claim to have gone to heaven or hell. So it's virtually certain that at least one of those experiences was veridical. I told my interlocutor, and this is a direct quote from my comment, quote, If you really think this isn't a bad argument, then congrats, you're a theist. You admit veridical experiences of God and veridical near-death experiences. Now I just need to move you from generic theism to Christian theism, end quote. Let me move on to my next response to the evidential problem of evil. Response 2. The Bible teaches certain doctrines that increase the probability of God and suffering. It is the case that the problem of evil and suffering is easier to deal with given the Christian God instead of a generic concept of God. This is because the Bible teaches certain things that increase the probability of suffering. What are these doctrines? Well, I already mentioned one above, namely that God's use of the butterfly effect actually has a biblical basis as it's presupposed in the story of Joseph and it's explicitly stated in Romans 8.28. However, there are others. Let me mention two of them. Doctrine 1. God's main purpose for this life is not happiness, but knowledge of himself. And a mountain of testimony shows that God uses suffering to bring people to repentance. One thing I've noticed over the years, from listening to testimony after testimony after testimony of people coming to faith in Christ, is this. Every single one of them involved a long, hard road of suffering that culminated in the person coming to the end of their rope and crying out to Jesus for help and salvation. We're in a sin situation. We've all fallen short of God's moral standard, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. And as a holy and just judge, Psalm chapter 11, verse 6, Psalm chapter 9, verses 7 to 8, Psalm chapter 10, God must punish sin. As a loving being, though, John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God doesn't want to punish us, but desires to forgive us. God became incarnate, as John 1.14 says, and took the punishment on himself at the cross of Calvary, Romans 5.8. All one needs to do is repent and receive this gift, confessing Jesus as their Savior and Lord. See Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7, Romans chapter 10 verse 9. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9. If God knows that a person would freely choose to receive God's gift of salvation if he endured through an immense amount of suffering, then it makes sense to think that God will allow suffering to enter that person's life for the sake of their eternity. After all, which is better, 
to suffer for a finite amount of time and gain eternal life or to live an okay life for a finite amount of time and end up either in eternal agony or being annihilated in the flames of hell. Evangelicals disagree on what happens in hell, but I think that annihilationism is overly, overwhelmingly evident in scripture. So many people have come to Christ because of immense suffering. Testimony upon testimony could be compiled to show that the majority of people who become born-again Christians actually have, in part, suffering to thank. You know, just for the atheists in the audience listening to this argument and think that God might be a for letting people suffer just so that they can become Christians and have faith in Christ, what would it be better for God to do? To let them suffer maybe a lot in this life and end up in eternal life in heaven where they will live forever in bliss uninterrupted or let them live a relatively okay life and end up burned up in hell never to live again for all eternity to die in a live cremation to be annihilated and re be remembered with shame and everlasting contempt what would be better i I can speak for myself, I'm glad that God allowed me to suffer what I suffered because it led me to Jesus. I would go through it all over again if it would bring me to the Lord. Yes, I absolutely believe that pain and suffering is one of God's ways of drawing us to himself. As C.S. Lewis once put it, quote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world, end quote. And as Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen once said, quote, Sometimes the only way the good Lord can get into some hearts is to break them, end quote. Doctrine 2. The Bible teaches that God can use suffering to shape our moral character. Suffering leads to character development. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5 verses 3 to 5, quote, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, end quote. James chapter 1 verses 2 to 4 says, quote, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, end quote. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 7 says, quote, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed, end quote. From these passages, we see that the Bible teaches that God can use suffering to build character. God can mold us into better people through what we suffer. The atheist may scoff, God would really allow a lot of suffering just to develop character? Well, yeah. Well, what kind of character traits could we not obtain in a suffering-free world? I can think of a few. Courage, compassion, forgiveness, self-sacrifice, charity. I think we can all agree that these are moral virtues, and I think we can all agree that it is better for a person to possess these moral properties than to lack them. Now here's my question. Is it possible for people to obtain these virtues in the lack of suffering? Can you have courage in the lack of danger? No, in order to develop courage, you need chances to be courageous. In order to be compassionate, you need someone suffering so that you can be compassionate. In order to develop the virtue of forgiveness, you need to have some evils done to you so that you'll have transgressions to forgive. Want a world where people are charitable? Welcome to a world with poverty. For certain moral virtues to exist or develop in human beings, there must be some evil and suffering. In fact, each moral virtue has a specific kind of suffering that correlates with it, as I've already pointed out. Let's look at this chart. 
You would never know what courage is unless you had to face danger. You would never know what forgiveness is unless you had someone who wronged you and gave you a sin to forgive. You can't just snap your fingers and suddenly develop these traits in a puppet. Remember when I said in the previous video that I would get back to step E in Tim Stratton's three circles model? Well, I've just gotten back to it. Doctrine 3. Mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purpose. Dr. William Lane Craig writes in his book, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, that, quote, Rather than submit to and worship God, people rebel against God and go their own way, and so find themselves alienated from God, morally guilty before him, groping in spiritual darkness and pursuing false gods of their own making. The terrible human evils in the world are testimony to man's depravity and our state of spiritual alienation from God. Moreover, there is a realm of beings higher than man also in rebellion against God, demonic creatures, incredibly evil, in whose power the creation lies and who seeks to destroy God's work and thwart his purposes. Christians are thus not surprised at the moral evil in the world. On the contrary, we expect it. The scriptures indicate that God has given mankind over to the sin it has freely chosen. He does not intervene to stop it, but lets human depravity run its course. Romans chapter 1 verse 24, Romans chapter 1 verse 26, and Romans chapter 1 verse 28. This only serves to heighten mankind's moral responsibility before God, as well as our wickedness and our need of forgiveness and moral cleansing, end quote. Dr. Michael S. Heiser explains that there are actually three biblical reasons for why the world is so messed up. All three of these episodes happened during the primeval history period of the Bible, which is Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Dr. Mike. Early church discussion, people like Irenaeus, for, for instance, you will find the idea that the sin of the watchers is sort of lurking behind things like human depravity and the origin of, of the expansion of sin, the, the proliferation of evil, the proliferation of wickedness throughout the world. And in, in, case, in the case of some Second Temple writers, they, they would even speak of what the watchers did is the origin of sin. You say, well, what, what about what happened in the garden? Uh, apparently some second temple Jewish writers thought that, you know, Adam, Adam could kind of get a pass because, you know, he was kind of dumb. He got deceived, you know, that, that sort of thing. Eve was deceived. And then Adam sort of just didn't know what was going on. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll try to give him a pass and then they'll, they'll put everything at the feet of the watchers. But I think uh, in, in biblical theology, we're more consistent saying, yeah, you know, here's when, sin, rebellion, enters God's world in, in Genesis 3. And then we have this other thing happen in Genesis 6. And I've made the comment before that, and especially in Unseen Realm, that, again, if you asked a, a Jew, why, you know, why is the world the way it is? Why is, why do we get depravity? Why, you know, there is, is humanity so messed up? If you asked a Jew that question, you'd get, oh, well, there's here's where it started back in Genesis 3 or it started in Genesis 6. You're going to get one or the other there. And then they're going to talk about Genesis 6, about how what the Watchers did to transmit forbidden knowledge to humans. And humans took that knowledge and basically perverted it and turned it uh, against themselves. And, you know, things like, you know, lust and, and whatnot, all, all this is going to be laid at the feet of the watchers, their entrance into the world and their interaction with people. And that's going to be the, the, the real guts of why the world is the awful, in the awful condition it is. It's going to be the watchers. Then, of course, you know, thirdly, you have what happens at, at Babel. So I've made the comment before that you're dealing with three episodes here, but in Christian theology, the Christian tradition, what, what people grow up hearing in church, they're only going to be oriented to one, and that is the you know, Genesis 3 incident, the fall. Whereas if you asked a Jew the same question, that is not the answer you'd get. And the Old Testament, again, never references Genesis 3 as an explanation for the condition of the human heart or the condition of, of human PF logo. wickedness. Doctrine 4. A day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. Yes, we'll go to a perfect afterlife if we trust in Christ. That much is true. But even our physical universe will be reformed someday. The Bible says that a day will come when sickness and pain will be completely done away with, and people will be held culpable for the nasty deeds they did. 
This is talked about in Revelations chapters 20 to 21. Justice will be served in a perfect way. That day will come, but not yet. Now, you may be wondering what's holding God up. One answer is that some of the viewers of this video may be. The Bible teaches that God is procrastinating the cosmic apocalypse so that more people will come to trust in him and ergo spend eternity with him in heaven. He's delaying out of his love for mankind. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all, everyone, to come to repentance. When you read 2 Peter 3.9 in context, you see that the entire passage is actually talking about why Christ is taking so long to return. And Peter says this is the reason. God wants all people to be saved. He's tarrying for the sake of those still yet to repent. If a person will repent tomorrow, God will keep the world spinning until tomorrow. If a person would repent in 2032, if God allowed the world to continue that long, then God will allow the world to continue until then for the sake of that one person. Atheists at this point might object that we have no reason to think that the aforementioned biblical doctrines are true. However, this response would be illegitimate. For it is the atheist who is making the claim, er and ergo, bearing the burden of proof, that suffering makes God's existence improbable. The problem of the evil is an argument for atheism. It's an argument for atheism. So the atheist, therefore, is the one who needs to back up the argument if he thinks it supports his worldview. If the atheist says God's existence is improbable in light of suffering, to this, I say, not the Christian God. The atheist needs to show that the Christian God is improbable relative to the suffering in the world. What he needs to do is either falsify these biblical doctrines or show that they wouldn't affect the probability structure even if they were conceded. Response 3. Relative to the full scope of the evidence, God's existence is probable. Probabilities are always relative to some background information. For example, suppose we're given the information that Dave is a member of Greenville Wesleyan Church and that 90% of Greenville Wesleyan Church members are young earth creationists. Relative to that information, it's highly probable that Dave thinks evolution is false. But now suppose we're given the additional information that Dave is a biologist and that 99% of biologists do accept the theory of evolution. Relative to this new information, it now becomes highly improbable that Dave is a young Earth creationist. There are many sound arguments for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity. It is not possible to defend every single one of these arguments in any justifiable depth in this video. However, I will defer the viewer to the other places in which I defend these arguments. One place is in my 2019 book, The Case for the One True God, a scientific, philosophical, and historical case for the God of Christianity. Another place is on my blog, on CerebralFaith.net. And of course, I've got several videos about these arguments here on the Cerebral Faith YouTube channel. Imagine a scale, as it were, with all of the arguments for God's existence on one side and evil and suffering on the other side. When you take all of the evidence into account, God's existence becomes overwhelmingly more probable than his non-existence. In fact, Two arguments for God have a very peculiar bearing on the validity of the evidential version of the, of the problem of evil. The moral argument shows that evil is actually evidence for God. Consider the moral argument when phrased this way. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, evil exists. Three, therefore, objective moral values and duties exist. 
for, therefore, God exists. And the modal ontological argument doesn't deal with probabilities at all. It deals with modal logic, what is necessary and what is possible. And this argument goes that if it's even logically possible that a maximally great being, aka God, exists in some possible world, then he exists in all possible worlds, including the actual world. So the ontological argument, if it's sound, completely makes the evidential problem of evil irrelevant. In conclusion, I think the problem of evil is a failure at disproving the existence of God. I think that in this video and the last one, the problem of evil has been successfully answered. But when I say answered, I mean answered intellectually. Evil and suffering is far from just an academic issue for Christian apologists and academics to wrestle with. Evil and suffering hits us where we live. Therefore, it's important that we take a pastoral angle to it. And that will be the subject of the next video.